I'm uh, Matthew Lowenstein, a Hoover Fellow at the Hoover Institution here at Stanford University. And I'm pleased to have with us today uh, Zoe Liu, who's presenting uh, some of her really exciting new work on Chinese sovereign wealth funds. And this is going to be interesting to uh, people who, who watch the Chinese economy and also who watch the, the growing um, uh, a strategic uh, competition between China and, um, uh, and the United States. And um, uh, Zoe is uh, quite an accomplished scholar. She's the Maurice Greenberg Fellow for China Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. Uh, she researches there the international political economy, global financial markets, uh, sovereign wealth funds, among other, among other issues. And she's the author of two books, Can BRICS De-Dollarize the Global Financial System? And Sovereign Funds, How the Communist Party of China Finances Its Global Ambitions. And it's really an honor to, to have you here today, Zoe. So I'm gonna, gonna start off by just asking you, uh, basically, what what is this, can you explain what is the sovereign wealth fund and what makes China's different? Yeah, thank you so much, Matthew, for your extremely uh, generous introduction and kind. And it's also a great honor to be here with you. Um, I really like the question you asked because that uh, I, that's really the motivation uh, driving me to study uh, sovereign funds. Um, most of the world's sovereign wealth funds are. Uh, capitalized by the monetization of natural resources. Not surprisingly, you know, for example, the very first one, the very first sovereign wealth fund was created by Kuwait in 1955 from oil revenues. And most of the sovereign wealth funds today are capitalized by revenues from natural resource endowments. Those are God-given incumbent wealth. You just, you know, you, you, dig in, you dig deep enough, you find the natural resources and uh, you, you sell it in global market and you get the money. China is different, especially considering that China is now the world's largest crude oil importer and the largest LNG importer. So the naturally, the, the, the question becomes how China created its sovereign wealth fund. And as I look into it, it turned out that actually in the process of creating its so-called sovereign wealth fund, it's not based upon God-given unincumbent wealth. It actually involves the Chinese government using explicit or implicit money. Uh, sorry, uh, it involves the uh, Chinese government uh, using explicit or implicit leverage uh, to raise capital in order to uh, capitalize what I call sovereign leverage funds. So China is different and uh, its sovereign funds are called sovereign leverage funds. And uh, broadly speaking, it has two, the so-called sovereign leverage funds have two primary distinctive features. The first one is that the funds were seeded with capital raised from the Chinese state, taking on leverage, either explicitly or implicitly. Secondly, these funds were also generally funded without an explicitly defined geoeconomic mandate. However, they have uh, evolved and they tended yeah. to adopt underlying geoeconomic agenda as they expand, as a different leader emerges, such as President Xi Jinping. That's, uh, that's fascinating. Um, and, and so uh, given that, given that these are, are quite large in size and that they operate quite differently from sovereign wealth funds around the world, you know, what larger implications does that have for the Chinese economy, uh, for, for uh, where it's headed, for, for the solvency of the financial sector? Um, you know, why, why do we need to know about this? Uh, thank you, Matthew, for the question. Um, I do think that uh, sovereign leverage funds are very relevant, not just for the Chinese economy, but also for the, where the Chinese economy is going and to what extent the Chinese government can finance its industrial uh, policies. And the very first time that the Chinese government uh, leveraged its foreign exchange reserve to create it, its first sovereign leverage fund was to save or to recapital, save China's um, banking system from collapsing and uh, to bail out Chinese banks that were uh, crippled by uh, non-performing loans. And mm. that was in the early 2000s when the, uh, the so-called big four, the ICBC Bank of China, Agricultural Bank of China, and uh, China Construction Bank, all these big four were crippled because of the they accumulated a large amount of non-performing loans. 
by international standards, if your uh, number of women were, was, were, were reached to a point such as higher than 20%, uh, such as one, than 20%, you can literally be considered as in, insolvent. And at that time, those Chinese banks were literally considered by international standards uh, insolvent. And it was at that time that Central Huijin was created using Chinese foreign exchange reserves to uh, essentially not just to bail them out, to recapitalize them, but eventually to help restructure these banks. And then later, Central Huijin, this playbook was also being used to re restructure China's um, stock, uh, stock brokerage firms and uh, policy banks. So this becomes a playbook that makes the Chinese financial regulators, uh, financial regula make Chinese financial regulatory agency as well as Chinese uh, authorities like the CBOC to um, basically have a ready to go playbook. And they, have they used it recently? Yes, they did. You know, when the Baoshang Yinhang was in trouble, mm. or I mean, th th that's the same thing. It's not as the newspaper discovered saying that some news say that, oh, it's the PBOC, bail them out. It's not the PBOC, it's Central Huijin. So they are very relevant for the financial stability mm. of uh, the Chinese uh, financial for, for China. And in the context of Xi Jinping, emphasize building China as the financial power, building China, strengthen China's financial power, making China a so-called Xinrongxianguo financial powerhouse. Um, the role of China's government-owned investment institutions, specifically these sovereign funds, are going to be um, are only going to be more important. That, that, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. In other words, there's a uh, an effect, a policy mandate that all these uh, the, these sovereign uh, wealth or sovereign leverage funds have. And, and as you just uh, explained, in, in a domestic context that plays out or has played out recently in bailing out certain um, struggling financial institutions and, and perhaps uh, uh, other um, uh, entities such as uh, Baoshan Yinhong and then you mentioned uh, Hengfeng Yinhong in your talk. Um, and then, so so, how does this policy mandate play out, play out uh, overseas in the in the um, foreign currency uh, investments, and and why is that important? Um, for foreign investment, so again, let me take a step back by saying that you know the first time when China started to use foreign exchange reserves, what was not uh, was not to advance an overt geoeconomic or geostrategic agenda because you know it was used to solve a banking crisis at home, right? Um, but as China's foreign exchange reserve accumulate more and more, uh, naturally there and because of Central Huijin's uh, reform agenda, reforming China's banking system and uh, stock, the uh, uh, the brokerage firms was so successful. This positive experience and positive track record of Central Central Huijin, combined with China's growing amount of foreign exchange reserve, especially since China joined the WTO export. Um, uh, 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 ballooned, people started to ask the questions, you know, state-owned enterprises started to say, why couldn't we use foreign exchange reserves to invest in uh, overseas mines? How about, you know, you just uh, help me to invest overseas? And in particular, the SOEs at that time, they had a um, very strong voice because of the so-called going out uh, policy or going out of strategy, right? So there was this intense domestic debate, which eventually led to um, the establishment of the CIC, which uh, was the very first time that China used for the Ministry of Finance issued a bond, which was the uh, explicit method of raising capital to capitalize the sovereign leverage fund. And then once the CIC uh, used uh, raised capital to buy foreign exchange reserves from the uh, from the PBOC uh, to capitalize CIC. Once the CIC was established, uh, it the it merged. Central Huijin into uh, CIC as a domestic subsidiary, but then overseas, it made the very first de debut to Western capital market by investing in um, Blackstone. And since this relationship was so important, not just from an economic perspective, but also from a political perspective. Uh, mm -hmm. One person told me in, 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 when I when I did when I was doing field research. One, one person told me that people at that time considered Mr. Schwartzman as one of the very few people who can whisper into American policy makers' ears. And obviously later, even uh, in President Xi Jinping's time, he had that, uh, President Xi Jinping and Mr. Schwartzman had launched along the side of Davos and so on and so forth. 
So this relationship building is very important. And then on the other hand, it also, uh, all these, a lot of these uh, foreign investment made by China's summer funds also tend to uh, advance uh, or correlate with China's, where the Chinese government, Chinese, uh, the, the Communist Party of China and the Chinese government intend um, to expand. Like for example, CIC, in the early days of the CIC establishment, China was China emerged as the large oil importer importer in the world. So CIC in the early world, it uh, early stage, it invested in a lot of oil and gas companies. And later, with the collapse of the global commodity super cycle, followed by the um, uh, mm. 2007 eight financial crisis, it moved on to um, investing in food and agricultural products because of China's emphasis on uh, food security. And more um, a more overt expl- uh, play would be uh, the establishment of the Silk Road Fund since, mm. in, uh, since President Xi Jinping came to power. That was specifically to establish the to advance the Belt and Road Initiative. Wow, Zoe, that's that's absolutely fascinating, and that's a that's a, an extremely c- clear and and concise um, uh, analysis of what is an, an extremely complex topic. So so it's really been an honor, and thank thank you so much for joining us today. Once again, everybody uh, can buy uh, uh, Zoe's book. It is um, Sovereign Funds: How the Communist Party of China Finances Its Global Ambitions. Happy Lunar New Year to everybody. Happy Year Um, of the Dragon. Happy Year of the Dragon.